Good evening. On behalf of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, we would like to welcome you to this webinar entitled Mobile ECMO, the do's and don'ts. My name is Awari Hyang, a thoracic surgeon and ECMO director at WVU. The option of mobile ECMO has grown in relevance and is a timely topic as many centers seek to extend care to patients in locations outside the immediate vicinity. Over the next hour, we will listen to the erudite opinions of experts in this space. We greatly welcome your questions and encourage you to type or paste these directly into the chat box at the bottom of your screen, and we shall be monitoring these in real time. I am joined today by my distinguished digital moderator, Anna Chulo, from Salt Lake City. Dr. Chula is an assistant clinical professor at the University of Utah, where she works as a cardiothoracic intensivist and conducts research on temporary mechanical support. Dr. Chulo will introduce the speakers. Good evening, everyone. So the members of our uh, distinguished panel tonight include Dr. Jeffrey Javidfar, a lung failure and general thoracic surgeon at Emory University, where he serves as the chief of cardiothoracic surgery at the Atlanta Veterans Affairs Hospital and holds leadership positions within the Emory ECMO lung and transplant programs. Next is Dr. Uh, Hitoshi Hiroshi. He is the director of the ECMO program and cardiac critical care unit of the Vertoa Health at Our Lady of Lords Hospital in Camden, New Jersey. He is an adjunct professor of surgery at Thomas Jefferson University with a primary interest in ECMO with numerous publications in this domain. Then we have Dr. Corey Allwart, who is the chief perfusionist at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Corey served as the ECMO coordinator at Mayo for over 10 years and has a PhD in physiology from the University of Arizona. And our final panelist is Dr. Dmitry Yiannopoulos, who is an interventional cardiologist, professor of medicine and emergency medicine, director of the Center for Resuscitation Medicine at the University of Minnesota, and an expert in CPR resuscitation and acute cardiovascular care. Once again, we would like to remind you guys that the chat is open for questions, so please post them there and we'll try our best to address them all. Our first speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Javidfar, has published widely on the use of ECMO with particular insight on the management of the obese patient. He presents today an erudite compendium that addresses the younger, newer program seeking to set up a mobile ECMO capability. His talk is entitled, The Do's for the New Mobile ECMO Center. Dr. Javidfar. Hello. The mobile ECMO programs and, and building them poses a unique challenge uh, across the sphere. Uh, today, we'll go over the topics and the different steps that are required to building this new program. First, we need to identify a remote cannulation team. Then you need to establish remote criteria for those patients, selection criteria. Then you'll have to come up with a triage protocol and then a simplified cannulation protocol. And based off of that, a list of supplies and your transport plan. But all of that centers first around uh, building an effective uh, program at your institution first. Without that effective program, you're not gonna have the foundation to be able to build your mobile ECMO team. And so that home team consists of your post ECMO cannulation management team. That's your critical care providers, the nursing staff, perfusionists, your ECMO specialists. You're also gonna need to have from that group, a triage person, somebody that can triage the calls from outside referring centers. that can really get, you know, cut through and see which are the patients that are gonna be the most appropriate and could most benefit from your ECMO. Then the, you'll have the remote team. The remote team is gonna consist of a cannulator, preferably one of the, some of your more experienced cannulators, uh, as well as uh, a critical care provider. It's important to have two different people fill these roles. Um, either you also have to have an assistant. That assistant can be the critical care provider, but it's important that uh, you have somebody that can focus on the cannulation and then somebody that can focus on the uh, managing of this patient. Oftentimes at a, a smaller hospital in a remote setting, they may not have a, another critical care provider and your team will have to essentially be able to run a soft code or sometimes an active code. And oftentimes that requires you know, two different sets of brains to be able to manage all of that. You'll also need a perfusionist or an ECMO specialist, not only to help you with the uh, you know, getting on ECMO, but then also to help manage and deal with pump issues on the ride back to the referral center. And then lastly, you'll need a critical care nurse, again, somebody who's familiar with the ECMO space to manage the drips, the medications, and then you'll need either a pilot or a driver to get back and you know, get you back to your home institution. So let's talk a little bit about the selection criteria. 
what are the types of patients that you're going to consider? You know, it, are they going to be the same criteria as you use for your in-house uh, patient? And I would say that at the beginning, when you're first starting out, you may want to start consider, you know, with the more straightforward patients. You may want to um, uh, avoid some of the more complicated cases. Similarly, you may want to start by doing DV ECMO first, as the veno arterial patients tend to be a little bit more unstable. And in that immediate post cannulation phase, they're still not terribly stable. And your transport window can sometimes fall in that, in that period of instability. Here you'll see a sample of our art triage sheet as we look to try to you know, gain some data from the referral center. And this really helps shape our cannulation strategy and our decision to whether you know, to offer ECMO to, these, uh, to this patient or not. Again, your selection criteria, when you're first starting out, we encourage you to start out with the more narrow criteria and then as your program gains experience, you expand. For example, in our space, we, when we first started doing this about six, seven years ago, we had an upward limit on the uh, number of the obese patient. And we would start with 30, a BMI of 40, maybe 50. And then as, uh, as we gained experience, we're pushing the envelope to 60 and 70. But again, with a brand new program, just starting out, this may not be the way to go. Um, again, this is a, a, a sample of a mature program selection criteria. Once we develop that, then you're gonna to have to talk about your cannulation. And you have to think about, you know, where are you gonna be doing this? Are you gonna be doing this at the bedside, in the cath lab or in the OR? As our program has evolved, we've moved away from the cath lab and the OR just because of some of the logistical difficulties that have settled on a bedside uh, approach. Once you start doing it at the bedside in a remote hospital, then you have to think about the sites. Are you gonna be a fem fem program? Uh, FEM IIJ, are you going to provide a, a remote dual lumen access? Uh, and these are just things to think about as, as you do it, because you're going to need to, uh, based off of this, you're going to de determine your imaging strategy and the supplies you bring with them. For example, our program doesn't offer dual lumen remotely, so we don't need to bring a, an extra cannula uh, that offers that. Um, as a result, also then you can kind of take a look at the different types of uh, supplies we have here. And again, in this space, you're, you're going to be limited on, on, on the amount of supplies you can bring with you based off of weight, especially if you're flying or just the physical space. And so you're going to have to settle on one or two types of cannulas, you know, to fit the FEM-FEM approach, maybe a, another type of cannula for your FEM-IJ, and then the wires that go along with that. And so we want to be thoughtful of that. This isn't the home institution where you're going to have everything available in your OR or in your ICU. Um, so we're going to have to settle on a consensus of what, what works best for, for the most people. And then uh, before we leave, we huddle. When you're doing a remote cannulation, you're essentially out on an island. So you're going to need to plan and think about things ahead of time. What is the patient's weight and height? What's their BMI, their BSA based off of this and their disease process? What are the minimal amount of flows that we need to be able to proceed? Um, what are their current lines? Do we need to move the lines around? Have they had any history of certain vascular procedures that would preclude us from using a certain site? And then you need to come up with a plan A, and then more importantly, a plan B, and make sure that you have the supplies to be able to meet both of those things. Uh, you know, should you encounter the need to kind of change an audible into a different situation. Then as we go get moved closer to cannulation, our program sends a letter to the referring center and where we're very clear about expectations. And, and the most important thing is to talk to, to the referring center and the family and make sure that they're aware that when we get there, we're going to be evaluating this patient for ECMO, but not, and potentially not always guaranteeing that when we get there, we will continue for ECMO. As many people know, when you arrive to a place or you get a transfer from another hospital, uh, the stories sometimes can be a little bit different. And when we get there, a patient may not be appropriate for that ECMO. So a decision needs to be made. Similarly, this serves as an option for, uh, this serves as a forum to allow uh, for uh, uh, people to, uh, you know, if we need the uh, blood products to be ready ahead of time and different other things to be resuscitated. And then the transport plans. How are you going to get there? How far are you from the ECMO center uh, and uh, to this, this referring hospital? How sick is the patient? Do you need to get there quickly by maybe by air? 
If you're going to fly in, are you going to use a helicopter? What is the weight of everybody that's there? Uh, is the weather going to permit it? Do you need to, you have to think about the uh, transportation if you're going to be flying to an airport, ground transportation from that airport to the hospital. And then uh, think about the comfort of the crews that are transporting these patients. Have they done ECMO transports before? It's a great idea at the beginning to do a couple of dry run, to figure out where things go, make sure you have enough space, enough supplies, and that the teams are comfortable. And then once, you, you, once you've done your remote cannulation, it's important to think about, you know, what are going to be our next steps? When do we start weaning the vents? When do we adjust the vasopressors? I would advocate, especially at the beginning, that uh, you bask in stability, that um, you make these changes when you get back to your home institution. The ride back to the home institution can be fraught. Ambulances can break down. Tires can become flat. Uh, weather can limit your ability to fly back in an expeditious manner. So a lot of times we try to avoid making changes until we're back at our home institution. The other thing is uh, always remember that you can always back out. If the story is not what it was and the patient is not an appropriate ECMO patient, then we don't, we do, you don't have to offer it. And then sometimes the cannulations can be difficult. This is a picture of a patient who underwent a difficult cannulation at a remote center. Uh, when we got back, we looked at the x-ray and we couldn't see that they were ephemerally cannulated and we couldn't see the cannula. We discovered them lower on. And you know, the right thing to do was to you know, extricate the patient from the remote hospital, get them back to our hospital. And then once we get back to home base, we can rework the cannulas, make sure things are okay, and, and kind of go from there and optimize the situation. Thank you for your time. Dr. Jarvifar, that was great. Thank you so much. A question I have for you is, um, you know, how has COVID-19 actually impacted uh, the mobile ECMO component for your uh, institution? Uh, that's, that's a really great question. As, as you know, across the country, the demand for ECMO has really skyrocketed. And so um, the number of, practically speaking, the number of triage calls during the peak of the pandemic was anywhere from 10 to 20 a day. The patients themselves are on ECMO for long periods of time, sometimes several months. So the amount of available beds has gone down. So we have to get creative in how we approach these patients. A lot of times we will try to reach out to our referring providers and ask them to notify us early of at-risk patients so that we can work together uh, to instill mitigating measures so that hopefully, if possible, we can avoid the need for ECMO. And if not, we can strike early while the patients can still be salvaged. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Javid Farr. Our next speaker provides the perspective from a very vital part of the team, perfusion. His presentation is entitled, Perfusion Tips for Transportation. Dr. Allward. Thank you very much for allowing me to join this esteemed panel. That uh, first talk from Dr. Dr. Javid Farr was a nice segue into what I'm gonna be talking about. Uh, which is a little bit more related to the logistics and technical challenges and considerations. Uh, as an ECMO coordinator for 10 years or so at a, at a place that uh, does a fair amount of ECMO transport, I'll be offering my tips more from the technical side, again, uh, and less so from the patient care side, which the other three presenters tonight are going to cover. So when I started putting these slides together, I'm having trouble advancing the slide here. There we go. Uh, when I started putting these slides together, I was a little bit uh, kind of all over the place. I didn't know which, exactly which direction to go. I know I wanted to talk about a lot of different things, but I had trouble organizing my thoughts and getting them onto slides appropriately. And I thought, well, let me look at the ELSO guidelines. They've had um, transport guidelines for a number of years. And I thought maybe that would provide me a little structure for how to go about doing this presentation. And what I found out when looking back at those transport guidelines is they had just been republished in 2022, so in the last month or two, and they are extremely detailed uh, to an impressive degree. And so I thought that provided me a nice framework uh, to pass on some information to all of you to emphasize uh, the value of these guidelines and the importance of these guidelines. You can see on the left there, is the picture from this document that was published in ASIO again earlier this year. This shows, shows this beautiful ambulance outfitted with, with five chairs that swivel to give you 360 degree access to the patient. I can tell you that our ambulance looks nothing like this and it's 
Um, we thought we were doing a pretty good job until I saw this picture, but um, ours is certainly far less ideal than, than this, as will many of yours. I'm very envious of the people using this ambulance here. But back to the guidelines. So section one of these guidelines talks about the types of ECMO trans transports being done. Uh, with the meat, the meat and potatoes of this document really is section two through five. Section two talks about mobile ECMO specific considerations, such as communication and documentation, both within your team um, and at the referring hospital. It spends a great deal of time talking about the equipment and supplies and many things that you may not have thought about or covered in this document. So a lot of centers, when they're first starting ECMO, they think, you know, well, we can, we do ECMO and we have a, uh, something like a cardio help that's very uh, mobile and easy to transport. So they think they can do mobile transport. Um, but what they may fail to consider are things like transport ventilators, uh, patient monitors, IV poles, balloon pumps, impellas, personnel, all trying to fit in the back of these ambulances, which can be very cumbersome. So I think new programs also suffer from kind of not knowing what they don't know. Uh, and I think that these guidelines will help clarify some of that stuff and get you asking some of those uh, pertinent questions. Section three talks about team structure and responsibilities. You know, who's gonna go on your transports and what is their specific role going to be? How are you gonna keep your staff competent and, and well-trained uh, so that, you know, you might have a very large team, but you do a small number of ECMO transports. So the number of times they may do a transport in a given year or even a couple of years can be very low or none. So doing simulations, mock transports and things like that, which we've done at our center, are very, very useful in keeping your, your team uh, competent in this area. Section four talks about mobile mission specific guidelines. So having protocols, for example, for activation, prioritization and mobilization of your team, transport logistics, you know, how are you gonna get to a hospital? How are you gonna get back? How are you gonna communicate? Things like that. Section five talks about clinical governance and risk management. So making sure that your team has quality improvement processes uh, to make sure you're doing the best thing and improving not only patient care and your outcomes, but also proving the logistics of your transport so that you learn from your own, your own program as you do things so you get better over time. Things like licensure and indemnity, indemnity. You may go to hospitals that require you to get emergency privileges. Um, and how might that change if you're crossing state lines for an ECMO transport? Uh, finances, uh, making sure you're getting reimbursed uh, either from insurance or from the referring hospital. Um, and team safety and well-being. And I wanted to emphasize a little bit about safety and uh, team safety and well-being because that was really brought to the forefront over the last couple of years with COVID ECMO. So we started transporting uh, COVID patients pretty early during the pandemic at our center. And after a few of these, we decided to publish our experience in the, in the Mayo Clinic proceedings, uh, just giving some recommendations and, and tips for those teams out there that might be doing the same, because we're not only trying to get the patient to our hospital safely, but we're trying to get our team back to the hospital safely. We had the unfortunate uh, experience back in 2012, I believe it was, at the Mayo Clinic in Florida, where two of our uh, staff from the Mayo Clinic were killed in a helicopter crash. This was not on an ECMO transport, it was a heart procurement for transplant, but it really brought to the forefront at our hospital and in our enterprise that, you know, how are we insuring these patients and how are we really kind of uh, compensating uh, these staff members uh, for, you know, taking risks that may not be inherent to their job while they're at the hospital. So are they gonna get more insurance while they're out on an ECMO transport? Or are they gonna get higher, uh, higher, higher compensation or, or insurance coverage. So, and things like that are all listed in the ELSO document. Again, um, I thought found it very impressive the level of degree or the, the level of detail that they went into in those guidelines. So moving forward from that, every ECMO team is going to have things like checklists. And I debated making this entire eight minutes dedicated to maybe a checklist and kind of walking through it. And it's really just an incredible level of detail that is really hard to cover in eight minutes, but just be aware that uh, your team should and, and will have a good checklist and sometimes multiple checklists covering everything from communication to patient preparation to equipment, supplies, things like that. And if you don't have these checklists, you should uh, find out why and, and make sure you get some. Here's an example of an evaluation form that we use after COVID, uh, or I'm sorry, after ECMO, 
that transports. Um, you can see a picture on the right is a mock transport that we did uh, to help train our staff. But on the left is the form that we use to make sure we're learning from every run that we do. So again, not just learning from the patient care side, but the logistical side. So were there trouble with, is, was there troubles with the ambulance? Did we have all the medications and supplies that we needed? Were there any problems with the IV pumps? All those types of questions are things that you need to not only know in advance, but also evaluate as you go. And just to kind of emphasize the level of detail that we need to think about when organizing a transport program, um, I just provided a few things that, uh, that, can, that you can think about. Either I've experienced these myself or, or maybe others have, but um, all important uh, kind of obscure sometimes things to think about. For example, did you know that ECMO heaters are not often taken on ECMO transports? ECMO heaters draw a lot of battery power if you're using a battery supply. I've also seen ECMO heaters trip circuits in ambulances. So uh, they're often not taken at all. So you may have to tolerate a bit of hypothermia on some of your patients. Some patients, of course, that could be a good thing. Others, maybe not. What if your ECMO console is inoperable? So I don't even mean during support, but what if you get to the hospital and while you're setting up for the, for the procedure, you realize that your device won't power on? Did you take an extra one um, or did you prime it potentially before you even left your hospital, which is what we do. We set up and prime and then take the kind of fully functional device out to the other hospital. Um, can you run labs like uh, ACTs or ABGs while you're on the road in the back of an ambulance? What if the ambulance breaks down in the Arizona summer heat when it's 115 degrees? Do you have an exit plan for that and a backup plan to, to get back safely? What if the sending facility refuses to pay? And we have run across that as well. So my last slide here, since this webinar was really focused on the do's and don'ts of ECMO support or an ECMO transport, is I really encourage you not to do what Nike would like you to do, which is just do it. And I prefer that you take the approach where you use resources, and it could be from ELSO, they could be from other organizations like the STS or AMSEC or others. Uh, but I think a, a more logical approach would be to really emphasize those instead of just um, kind of just doing it on a whim, thinking you're prepared when you may not be. So thank you very much. Corey, thank you very much for that excellent talk. A question for you. How do outside facilities know to contact you and how is the ECMO team mobilized for transportation? Yeah, so thank you for the question. Uh, so outside facilities that we work with eventually get routed to our house supervisor. So they're the bottleneck in this whole process for us. So whether it's a perfusionist from across town calling me, telling me that they have a patient that needs ECMO, I will immediately call the house supervisor. I won't even call the cardiac surgeon. Uh, all of our calls get routed that direction. So that way there's a, an, an algorithm that we can work from every single time. Um, we have not really done any public outreach in terms of a campaign to make sure hospitals know about our ECMO transport program. But what we do is do that on an individual level, physician to physician, perfusionist to perfusionist, things like that. And we also do that anytime a hospital calls us uh, wanting to send some kind of patient to us. So maybe they called us too late, so we'll educate them on how to send them earlier and contact us earlier. Um, so it's really been on a, a, an individual basis, emphasizing you know, future um, opportunities. Outstanding, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Albert. So our next speaker has made a tremendous effort to bring mechanical support under the lens of NIH research. Uh, he is the PI for the arrest trial, and here Dr. Yiannopoulos will provide his perspective in research in mobile ECMO. Dr. Yiannopoulos? Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitations and honor to be here. I will uh, present um, mobile ECMO in the Minnesota mobile concept, which is a little different than, um, uh, about just transferring patients from another hospital. I'll focus on the cardiac arrest and effect of mobile teams and uh, mobility of patients um, with and without ECMO to be sur to survive in cardiac arrest. Um, these are my disclosures. I don't have any financial interest other than funding from the National Institute of Health and Department of Defense and charitable organizations to work on this field. So I will focus from now on to uh, the concept of uh, refractory cardiac arrest and what can be done. Um, I will be um, succinct in this because you probably all know about those things, but uh, it's a new field that's advancing rapidly and uh, you will be affected by it as it expands to uh, more commonplace in treating patients with cardiac arrest with ECMO. Um, here you can see three different graphs, uh, one from Japan, one from Korea, and one up on the upper left of the United States and North America, uh, Canada, from the ROC trial investigators. 
And basically the summary of this is the standard station strategies are inefficient as the duration of CPR increases and survival is grim after 30 minutes of CPR, even in the case where uh, patients are resting from uh, paramedics, which is uh, the upper left, 90% survival when you shock somebody immediately and upper is VF and about 30 minutes you drop to 15% and 40 minutes uh, at 3%. So that is the best case scenario is like somebody called the ambulance and they are resting from the medics. Everything else shows here in Japan, the last cohort published that about 30 minutes, the probability of survival is single digits. So what is the reason for that? Um, you know, this is, um, uh, it was always a concept, but uh, it has been proven subsequently by, our, first by our group and then subsequently then people from um, Paris and now with larger cohorts in the United States, uh, it's a fact and you know, at this point, the reason that people have refractory VF because they have a lot of underlying coronary artery disease and a higher probability of having two or three vessel disease, syntax scores in a moderate to high range, a lot of LAD and a lot of CTOs um, than other groups that have present with re resuscitated cardiac arrest or with people that have ST elevation and non stemmies the, the other concept here is that any cardiac resuscitation um, is very uh, dependent on the time of resuscitation. This is the most uh, time sensitive emergency that exists in um, acute uh, care other than exsanguinating hemorrhagic shock. You can see here that um, if you compare the ACPR program of the University of Minnesota compared to a standard very high functioning um, EMS um, group um, of uh, cities here or that were part of the ALPS trial, the amiodarone, lyrocaine, and placebo uh, randomized trial, you can see that if you match um, the cohorts before AIDS and characteristics, other characteristics, but also by time, you, can, uh, you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to see that there is a significant differences in the probability of offering neurological intact survival. Uh, at 30 minutes, you can see 5% survival rate in um, the United States with uh, VF patients that um, were randomized and um, the same time period ECMO support in CPR offers 75% survival. The majority of the patients arrive at 50 to 60 minutes, which is the reason that survival rates reported are lower than that. So because obviously having the um, cohorts without being a randomized trial that doesn't offer a lot of uh, support in uh, one statement, we did the arrest trial, the phase two trial, I will summarize, you can review it. It's a uh, you know, well-established trial now. Um, patients 18 to 75 uh, that failed three shocks in the field and they had the Lucas um, transport. They were um, basically transporting the University of Minnesota and um, they were randomized to either go early ECMO facilitators a station in the cath lab where you could uh, automatically put them on ECMO facilitate uh, recovery or they would be uh, treated as long as the emergency physicians wanted two, um, and they either declare them dead after at least uh, 60 minutes of CPR or um, futility has been reached. And if they had ROSC at any time, they would go to the cath lab and they could have been treated with ECMO if they rearrested. The trial uh, was stopped very early by the SMB um, just because of pre uh, reaching the posterior probability of 0.986, which was the pre-specified protocol uh, based um, uh, early stopping criteria um, and after 30 patients. Uh, the DSMB and NIH um, did not think there was equipoise and there, there was no ethical to continue randomizing patients in the standard ACLS arm. And you can see here the numbers uh, three months, uh, they had 43% survival, six out of 14 and one uh, zero out of 15 uh, surviving uh, into the control group. The hazard ratio was 0.16, one of the lowest hazard ratios ever achieved in a resuscitation trial. And um, you can see that um, the recently JAMA published um, the Prague trial that was a larger pre-hospital randomization that uh, was intention to treat. Um, and um, they showed that uh, there was a 32% survival rate in invasive strategy in 22, they missed the primary endpoint barely. Um, and um, there, there 
there are multiple issues with this trial, which I'm not going to go through because it will be heavily discussed and there is multiple publications coming out about uh, combining this data together. But you can see here the secondary point of neurological intact was 18% um, survival in the standard control and 30% hyperinvasive. There was 22 versus 36, uh, 39, 31%, uh, sorry, at six months and uh, survival was significant here in the Campion Meyer curve. The problem was this trial had uh, allowed for crossover and people in the standard group got ECMO. So six of the, uh, four of the six survivors in the standard arm actually received ECMO and that's why they missed the primary endpoint. If you analyze the trial as treated, this is the p-value, you can make your, um, your assumptions by yourselves. Uh, but the question is here, if you combine the arrest trial and the PRAC trial together, is this um, uh, obviously combined data between the two sites? You can see here that there is not a lot of uh, statistical equ you know, equipoise here. There's a really clear message that um, ECMO facilitated cessation, prolonged cessation uh, efforts is the only way to survive patients. And that was specifically true when your CPR reaches more than 45 minutes. If uh, you take the people as treated, uh, you have more than 12 times higher neurological intact survival rates from 2.3 versus 28%. And if you take it as intention you treat, you still had a, a whole seven, eight fold increase in survival. So we went one uh, further, um, a step further and uh, with the Helmsley Foundation charitable um, uh, grant, um, we basically were uh, able to remobilize the city and uh, have a mobile team. Instead of actually bringing patients to university all the time, we had three sites that um, we could cannulate peripherally with a mobile team. A physician and two medics from a flight um, uh, team uh, was 24 seven available, were dispatched with radios. We have uh, um, SUVs with sirens and lights under ambulance services. And we transformed three ECMO initiation hospitals, emergency departments and ED ECMO cannulation sites and we stay in the uh, cath lab at that area and then transport the patients to single centralized ECMO ICU. Physicians had privileges in all these three hospitals and um, we were able to show that we can shorten the duration to cannulation by seven minutes and it's 47% survival rate. And also um, that we can actually do this very quickly. The average cannulation time upon arrival to the cath lab uh, after arrival to the cath lab is about seven minutes in the meds department where the environment is a little more um, uh, complicated and you have a lot of different teams, the average duration was 10 to 12 minutes from arrival of the patient to be on pump. And now we are basically moving forward to have uh, uh, multiple um, abilities to cannulate patients based on their location. There is um, this mobile echo track that is effectively a cath lab on on, uh, on wheels with uh, x-rays, ECMOs, um, fluoroscopy and um, ultrasound and all these other emergency department necessary equipment to cannulate somebody on the back of the track. So we can actually non-mobilize patients, but uh, get to them. We can also see here emergency departments on the upper right corner, how we transform the room with fluoroscopic table and the ECMO circuit and there is an x-ray machine. And then uh, in the cath lab, obviously anybody who uh, arrests close to the hospital, they will actually be treated like this. And this is how I write to work. So um, I will stop here and get any questions if needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yanopoulos. This is an extraordinary body of work. A question for you. What are the next steps for ECPR in the United States? Is there, in your opinion, need for a larger study? That is an excellent question. NIH about uh, end of uh, uh, August had another uh, workshop on as in relation to this. And you can find that um, RS trial NIH workshop. Uh, I can also share it with you when I get a chance. Um, the, the summary of this is that Really, there is no equipoise anymore as, as far as I'm concerned, as far as the technology and the, and the expertise to offer improved survival uh, when the expertise is available. So I think the, the bottom line is in many states, um, when the infrastructure is not there, it's not a matter of doing a trial, but it's actually developing the expertise to deploy it. And, um, and, and what works here in Minnesota might not work 
in, um, in New York or in Chicago or when, anywhere else. And the reason for that is the, how you interact with your um, pre-hospital setting, uh, which team is the expert team to go out and do this or receive these patients. And also what are the specifications of your team arrangement? All of this have to be worked out by your own teams. And it's, it's a little bit like, um, I think, uh, transplant or bypass surgery when it started, right? Um, you have to train people to know how to do it. And we currently don't have this expertise widely available in the United States. Outstanding. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Thank you. So for our final speaker, uh, Dr. Harris, uh, whose talk centers on the do's and don'ts of the mobile ECMO program, uh, will speak to us about preparing for the unknown. So Dr. Hiroshi. Thank you for your introduction. The uh, slide check. Uh, ECMO consultation starts from the uh, conference call from the transfer centers connected to the CT surgeon, ECMO surgeon, and the CT uh, cardiology and primary critical care. And we have to make a quick decision using this conference call if we do the mobile ECMO, like uh, sending an uh, ECMO surgeon team and cannulate local hospital, and then they bring back from local hospital to the hub hospital. Or utilizing the CT surgeon at the local hospital, cannulate and bring back, or the transfer for the patient for the CT, uh, the ECMO evaluation. You have to make a quick decision using a conference call. And we rely on the uh, referral physician. And then the, uh, we have to extensively during the phone call, make sure the patient does not have a contraindication. For example, IBC filter issues and the COVID criteria. And also we'd like to know the, what kind of resources are available at the local hospital. And then the, maybe we may have a more strict uh, criteria for mobile ECMO like a host like groins, BMI issues, and the breathing issues. We had to make sure these cleared. We try to not to have any uh, surprise at the time of the arrival. And then the ECMO team will decide the final decision of it to go on the ECMO or not. It's okay to say no on the ECMO at the time of the variation. Of course, there is a cannulation method of BA or BB. Uh, this is the example of BA and the BBs. And then the uh, other way, using a single cannula uh, BB cannulation may not be a good idea for the mobile ECMO because it, it needs a fluoroscopy and the, uh, and the echocardiography, which requires uh, more resources. And, then, and we have to, should be determined the BA cannulation, BB cannulation before to go, and then the, do not deviate from routine cannulation. Do not to be a hero for that. And then the hub host, before we go, we have to establish a team who is a surgeon, who got perfusions, who will go with, and then the ground or transport. And we'd rather to take a consent. We'd like to talk with the family before leaving hospital. It stated the non-standard cannulations and also non-standard utilization ECMO for their support and also the, um, variety of the procedure associated with this ECMO and or transfusions consent. And also we'd rather to talk with the family face to face as uh, the possibility of the futile issue of the ECMO as well. We should not leave the, uh, the hub hospital without consent. And also the local hospital has to know before we arrive uh, what time the, uh, the team arrived to the hospital or not. And also mobile ECMO team should have the go, go bag, for example, transport bag, including cannula, socket, PPEs, and then the instruments, and then their ECMO tubing, variety of things, and with backup as well. It's gonna be a huge uh, bag, but the, everything need to be checked and the uh, parking list is available. And before to go, make sure everything in it. We can't expect anything at the local hospital, do not open this transport package for the routine cases. And also the local hospital, they have to, uh, they have to uh, prepare something for us. For example, just make sure the monitoring and but the, some of the uh, local hospital, if you go to once a year, they don't, they don't know about uh, much about ECMO. For example, the, uh, the A-line, uh, the, if the patient need to go to the VA ECMO, we'd rather to have a, upper extremity airline 
you do have a area in the femoral artery. Femoral artery may be just uh, measuring for the perfusion at uh, the uh, ECMO pressure. So we have to educate them some of them somewhat. And also the local host has a list of the preparing. So they will give them a list of the what do we need. And before we arrive, for example, medications, heparins, and then they expect nothing there. And we have to tell them what we need. And then they uh, We'd rather to have a hospital agreement so that we can talk with a, a hospital uh, intermittently, and also we do the debriefing, and then they uh, tell the hospital what we need. Bad thing is that do not ask everything at the arrival. As a, remember, the local hospital may have a very limited resources. That's why I ask for the hub hospital to put on the ECMO, right? And the arrival at the, at the local hostel, we should introduce myself and then the team members, vice versa, nobody knows, and then assign the rule. Who will be ECMO surgeon? Who is assistant? Who is a runner? Who is, a, who is X-ray? And what else we are available in this hospital? Make sure the checks echo before the uh, cannulator, BB, ECMO, these things. We have to find a review before go on and then decide. And cannulation should be the same way to do every, every hospital. I mean, the same way you do at your hub hospital and heparin should be drawn and having it somewhere and do not give it because we have a, often you seeing the vascular injury for the cannulation. We'd rather to give a heparin right before the uh, cannula goes in. So the ABA ECMO sequence, you have to write it down and then the uh, perfusionist assistant realize what the sequence will be BV ECMO cannulation sequence, it should be written there and educate these folks to assist you. And then the key of the cannulation, you, again, same technique. And then the uh, pre-discussion with the uh, perfusionist and, uh, and assistant, what kind of cannula we use. And make sure the uh, heparin is given the ECMO surgeon's order. Establish the DPC, the distal perfusion caster for the VA ECMOs. I try to avoid like this ischemic rig is develops for this is an imparasite. You watch for the other side as well. And it is a, avoid this the disaster happening, but do not bring a patient to the OR for the local hospital unless their emergency. We should bring the patient to have hospital prepare for the uh, hub hospital OR on the arrival. Straight go to the OR at the hub. And before transport, we should check the chest x-ray, make sure cannula is okay so that the ECMO runs well, and make sure that these are checked before moving a patient. We should call the families and make sure everything is stabilized before move the patient. Do not the patient, do not move the patient if the patient not stable enough. Put on stretcher, make sure the two oxygen tank available, the volume lines is there, which line is open, which is the medication line, make sure everything know about, and make sure the, these are fit to the elevator and ambulance. And if you do the air transport, you have to make sure this um, transporter holding or device will fit to your, your uh, jet or the helicopters. Thank you, attention. This is my email address. Uh, if you have any question, email to me. There are other resources listed here. We can uh, access to that. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hiroshi. So let me ask you a question. What are some of the main challenges in communicating with the local ECMO centers uh, uh, in that process? So the, I think uh, uh, out of time, we uh, calling, uh, getting a phone call the phone call coming from the, uh, to try to understand the patient, but the no referral, uh, they're illustrating the patient uh, and they give us uh, some uh, different in information. And sometimes we surprise at the arrival. And also we have to talk with a family member, otherwise the family member has a different opinion from the referral uh, physicians. So we'd rather to talk with the family uh, before we go in and then make sure everything packed Every, every single information you get. And before go on, make sure you see the patient. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, we will now pivot to questions from the chat and I will invite all the panelists to turn on their video and participate in this round table of questions. The first question is from Dr. Aurora from Manitoba in Canada. And he asks this of Corey. Corey, what are some of the tips and tricks you have found to be most effective? 
to maintain patient temperature when transferring patients in colder parts of the country. How can the referral team prepare best for this? Corey. Yeah, great. Thank you for the question. That's a very good one. Now, I am uh, lucky enough to live in a very warm climate in Arizona, so I don't. I can't speak from the uh, the side of trying to keep patients warm in a cold climate. But what I can tell you is that uh, a lot of the routine measures we would use for all patients, you know, things like blanket warmers, uh, warm, or I'm sorry, patient warmers, warm blankets, and things like that uh, to maintain temperature. But also, what you can do is there are some heaters now about the size of a toaster. Uh, they're not really designed for ECMO, but a lot of people do use them for that. So you could take those along uh, to get your patients prime warm so that, you know, you don't, so you don't cool them in the process of uh, that first kind of pass through the patient of the cold prime or room temperature prime. So, uh, you, so you could use a small heater like that to warm the prime and try to maintain their temperature, uh, normothermic, and, uh, and, and hopefully try to maintain uh, throughout the transport just with the blanket warmers. But um, yeah. So in terms of the cold climate, I can't answer that, but I think those are some of the tricks that you could use. And that way you don't have to necessarily continue to use that heater. Just use it while you're in the, uh, at the, at the referring hospital, and then you can turn it off uh, on your way back. Great. Thank you very much. So I have a question actually for each of our panelists. How do you guys individually staff, uh, you know, these ECMO, uh, mobile ECMO transports at each uh, of your institutions? I go first. Uh, I, we only have uh, two ECMO surgeons, and the other CT surgeon does the capability to do the ECMOs. But if there's a mobile ECMO, we just utilize the two ECMO surgeons to go. Okay. Um, at our institution, uh, we have trained several of our critical care providers to uh, be comfortable with uh, VD and, and VA ECMO. Um, so they will go with us. Uh, we will take uh, oftentimes either a CT surgery or cocoa care fellow with us, um, and then uh, a perfusionist to provide our, our local support. Um, and then uh, depending on the room, potentially uh, an ECMO coordinator. So the minimum team that we take is a perfusionist, two ICU ECMO trained nurses, uh, and a, a cardiothoracic surgeon. Sometimes we'll add uh, scrub techs or uh, other types of nurses if, if there's a complexity that we need to deal with. Um, our team is a little bit different than uh, what you're talking about because we are going for emergency circumstances, but our team consists of usually uh, interventional cardiology critical care, three only members of uh, to cover the whole city with experience and then we have some trainees in critical care um, in general that they want to be part of the team, but the core is uh, three individual cardiologists that take part shift 24 hours seven in order to get there. And one uh, medic uh, or flight nurse that has a lot of experience in transport for ECMO, but also uh, managing airways and a lot of trips. Excellent. Thank you. The next question is doctor, for Dr. Javid Farr. Jeff. What are some of the practical considerations for providing mobile ECMO in the morbidly obese population? That's an excellent question. Uh, the morbidly obese patients pose a unique challenge for uh, the cannulating team uh, and for the transport team. So the first step is planning ahead of time. You have to plan ahead of time, know what your patient, you know, how big this patient is um, and uh, bring with you longer access needles, stiffer wires, possibly larger cannula. When you get there, you have to be thoughtful with your approach in the cannulation. Uh, be careful when you're putting up your wires and dilating, putting the cannulas in place. And then when you get back to your home institution and you're trying to get the rest settings, trying to hold the paralysis, you're gonna have to be under the assumption that you're gonna need more flows. And oftentimes in those situations, you may need to convert to bicable drainage. So putting in that third cannula. Thank you very much. So Dr. Harris, I have a question for you. So what are some of the more common complications uh, that you uh, encounter during these ECMO transports? And, and typically what is your solution in that situation? So I'm often encountering the uh, volume issues, uh, volume depleted, so the ECMO drop flows and the pressure drops. So ECMO doesn't run, uh, everything, so, uh, the vital sign goes down. 
So we'd rather to give a more volume before go on. And also we put uh, like a five French or six French venous sheaths so they can give a volume very easily during transport. Thank you very much, Dr. Hiroshi. A question for Dr. Nianopoulos. Do you think that there is equipoise for another study? I think there might be equipoise in, uh, for studies in places that do not have ECMO. As I explained, like there is no way anybody in Minnesota or in Prague or uh, I don't know, another place that have been doing it to randomize patients to not ECMO. But uh, I think there is a role for studies of which techniques or approaches are best in each individual systems. So do you bring patients to the hospitals? Do you bring a team outside? Um, do you go to the house to the, bring the patient to rendezvous point? So things like this will have to be ironed out in trials in order to find the best practice and best survival rates for people to um, start working on um, the specifics of how to implement those strategies. I remind you that uh, there's a lot of trials that have been positive for any kind of ECMO other than resuscitation at this point. And so uh, it's important to realize that the, the magnitude of the effect that we as physicians require, sometimes do not allow us to randomize. A patient in extreme cardiogenic shock, when there's no other solution for their life, it's almost impossible to be randomized in, a, in an uh, ECMO trial because no one will not put them on. So it's a little bit of this conundrum that we have that uh, when there is a life or death situation, unless you make the distinctive decision that you will basically let some people die that you in front of you and you're okay with that, it's impossible to do trials. Thank you very much. Dr. Javafar, we have a question for you from actually our chat, uh, and that is clinically you've presented a lot of great data supporting this growth. As a large tertiary center that would like to start one, what kind of financial impact does Mobile ECMO pose on your center and how can you sell it to leadership? That's a great question. I mean, I think the first thing is, is to think about the fact that, you know, we want to provide great patient care to our, and so that should be the number one priority. But I understand that, you know, there's accountants and, and we have to make the, the, the things financially solvent. And so at our hospital, we would, uh, we bill for the cannulation and everything on the first day of arrival. The, the main ECMO center keeps the DRG. And then as a result, we also then, you know, keep that patient. And we found that this is a great way to increase our ECMO volumes and make the ECMO program itself profitable. Um, and so that, that's been able to help convince the hospital leadership to go along with us in those ventures. Great, thanks. Question for Dr. Allward. Corey, considering the resources that go into this, should the same rules apply for candidacy or should it be more stringent? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and one that we've had to ask ourselves a lot during COVID. Uh, so, you know, for example, we got to take care of our own patients first, you know, uh, before we start talking about going out uh, to other parts of the community. So we've really had to face that question a lot. And frankly, for the last year or two, we have had to be more stringent because, you know, ICUs are full uh, and things like that. And we just don't have room for barely our patients, much less others. You know, out, outside of that, I would say that, you know, I think any any patient that has a reasonable chance of survival, um, I, I think we would we would treat uh, as many of our own patients. Um, and if we if we think there's a high enough um, chance that they'll survive, then we'll go get them just as we would bring them from anywhere else in our hospital. Great, thanks so Thank much, Dr. Howard. So, Dr. Yiannopoulos, I have a question for you. Who will pay for this? Uh, essentially, a mobile eCPR program with results that are likely to demonstrate poor survival, quote unquote. Ah, I think there are a lot of assumptions in this question. Um, well, first of all, um, there is no different investment between um, eCPR patients and any other VA ECMO patients. They are basically treated for uh, with the same DRG. And um, I would actually um, ask you, actually uh, make a, an idea of what do you think is the survival of patients that leave the hospital with after eCPR, after 50 to 60 minutes of CPR before cannulation. What, just write something on the chat. What do you think would be that survival? 
So people that they left the hospital, uh, what would be the four or five year survival rate? Well, I'll tell you, I mean, you have to. So it's actually higher than LVADs. And so the LVAD uh, population has about, I would say 65% survival rate at three years. Um, and then the, the ECPR population has 68 to 72%, depending on um, the duration you wanna go to from three to four years. And if you're lucky to not go to LTAC, which is 85% of our patients, they have 85% five year survival rate. So these are numbers that they're not poor outcomes. And you have to remember people say, well, you treat a lot of people to save some, um, the denominator for all the cardiac surgery procedures of advanced mechanical support is the whole heart failure population in the millions. So how many of those we treat, if we were to treat all of them that they needed, how many would fall through the cracks? You realize that the ratios are very similar. The cost of all these are proportional. And there is a nice paper will be coming out soon comparing these populations and their cost that you will see uh, from our group. That Thank is you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Yiannopoulos. Unfortunately, we are at the end of our time. I would sincerely like to thank our distinguished panel of speakers and my esteemed co-moderator for these wonderful insights. Thank you also to the SDS for providing this forum and our organizers, Michelle and Amanda, for making this possible. Stay safe and good night. Thank you. Thank you to our moderators and panelists for your participation and insight. Join us on Thursday, March 17th at 5 p.m. Eastern for our next webinar, Management of Type B Aortic Dissection, Takeaways from the STS-AETS Guideline. The 2022 STS Coronary Conference is an exciting new educational event coming to Ottawa this June. Abstract submissions and registration will open in the coming weeks. Learn more and sign up to receive updates at sts.org slash coronaryconf. We invite you to become a member of STS if you're not one already. You'll enjoy a variety of discounts, benefits, and opportunities to help you grow professionally. Learn more at sts.org slash membership. Thank you and have a good night.